recording. And we'll start the webinar and have everyone join us. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Connections webinar today. Take a few seconds for everyone to get logged in. I'm going to talk about a little yoga and personal wellness today. So looking forward to that. Let everyone get started. Oh, we got some weird feedback. Good afternoon, Roberta. Welcome. Let everyone join us here. We can get some more folks to join us today. Roberta, this might be a personal session just for you. Oh, the pressure's off then. That's right. It also is 12.01, so we maybe are I actually, we started officially right on time, which sometimes doesn't happen. So I think we'll get a few takers here in the next minute or two. So that'll be good. Just waiting little by little. Maybe it's too nice outside. Everyone left their workstations and their computers and was like, forget it. I'm going outdoors instead of listening to the webinar. I don't blame them. <laughs> Gorgeous out. It really lucked out here in Wisconsin, that's for sure. I think this might be the first webinar we've done for the Our Connection series where everyone is participating or, you know, part, uh, panelists are from Ripon. Everyone's in the city of Ripon at one time, which typically is not the case at all. So it's sort of fun to have, you know, all Ripponites. You're right, Roberta. It's a webinar, so you're not allowed to talk, although we could let you talk. So if it does end up being an individual session, we'll, we can unmute you but we're glad you're here. Roberta, where are you joining us from? <laughs> Alaska, woohoo, that's, cool. that's, that's really exciting. cool. What is your weather like today? It's about 75 in Ripon today. It's an unseasonably warm, sunny spring day. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful, but freezing. Good. Well, why don't we get started, Emily and Tracy? And, um, well, hopefully, folks will 
will join us. And again, the session's being recorded, so we can obviously share it out, which is great. Um, and look forward to continuing to explore our partnerships as we move forward um, as well. Um, obviously, our webinar series has been very popular um, kind of since the pandemic started it was something we jumped into uh, kind of with the, oh, we probably should do things virtually, which Ripon does not typically do, just given some of our small, intimate nature. And, and, and these sessions have been going really well. And the exciting part, I think, is you know, we're thinking about 2021 and how excited everyone was to get to 2021 and um, really thinking about personal well-being and thriving and, you know, the impact the pandemic has had is very large, obviously. And, and we really started thinking about what, how can we share information with our alumni and friends that really speak to being well in a variety of ways. So our last session a couple of weeks ago, we talked about financial wellness and what does that entail? And so I'm excited today to have Emily Sheiks Ingeman and Tracy Mathias with me to talk specifically about personal wellness and really thinking about things in a, in a yoga mindset. Um, Tracy, 2007 grad of Ripon, studied biology, philosophy, and art. Perfect blend of the liberal arts for a yoga studio owner. Um, her studio is located in downtown Ripon. Um, and really, Tracy credits you know, her goals as serving our community giving a variety of classes for a variety of people, really doing um, some fun things like yoga in the vineyard at Vines and Rush's winery, uh, hosting a wellness retreat to Costa Rica pre-pandemic, um, teaching yoga at the Wilmore, of course, here on campus. And then since all of the chaos has ensued, starting to do outdoor courses more and online courses. So really fun, fun sort of way to think about things. Again, her studio is yoga, uh, Lotus Root Yoga here in downtown Ripon. Um, so when you come to campus, you can visit that as well. Um, and Emily and Tracy's journey sort of overlap in some ways. Um, Emily was introduced to yoga in 2008 when she was a student at Ripon. She's a 2012 grad. And um, when she worked in the admission office here on campus following graduation, she continued to explore yoga and her and Tracy actually met at a, the training downtown, um, which sort of evolved their relationship and friendship over the years. And now um, Emily teaches in Tracy's studio and they share lots of experiences together. And it's a great kind of Ripon collaboration on all levels in the city of Ripon and for Ripon College alumni to do together, which is I think awesome and cool. And who would have thought that that was sort of where your journeys would come, but I'm excited. Again, I'm not, I don't know much about yoga at all, so I'm excited to learn. Um, and I will turn it over to you, Emily and Tracy, to chat with Roberta and I and let us know what you have to, to say. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Amy, for those introductions and, of course, for having us here today to be part of the Our Connections webinar. Uh, so Amy shared a little bit about my background, but I'm Emily, and I'm very happy to be here sharing this perspective. So Tracy and I are here to share a really broad overview of yoga and how it can be a foundational part of your personal wellness. Uh, we think it's an incredibly valuable perspective to have at any time, uh, but especially in this past year, it has really been brought into focus how important it is to have knowledge, resources, and maybe even a system or routine like yoga to stay healthy and well. Oh, Tracy, sorry, you're muted. Just realized. Okay, hello. Um, my name is Tracy. Um, so the I wanted to explain the little picture that's on the um, title page there. It is from the yoga teacher training that Emily and I completed in 2016. We received our certifications through a small studio right here in Ripon. So we feel um, very proud to continue to offer yoga in Ripon and at Ripon College. Um, with this presentation, we're going to describe the benefits of yoga in several different ways, the physical benefits, the mental benefits, and the value of gaining a yoga perspective. So, and we will provide examples of how yoga can be applied practically. Oh. All right, fantastic. So getting right into the information, we thought we would start out with just this question of why do people like yoga? Why do people pursue this practice? And there's a whole myriad of reasons why, and we'll go through just a couple of those with some examples. 
So the first two I wanted to um, go through would just be improving flexibility and increasing balance. Um, I think we really find that one of the most common desired outcomes for why people pursue yoga is to go for that flexibility. And it does tend to really happen and increase for our students. And then in tandem with the second point of balance can be increased. Um, I know a great story of a student that I have had who um, she couldn't reach her toes for, you know, well over 35 years of her life, but then in just a couple of weeks of a consistent yoga practice can now do that easily. Um, and then these two points together, again, on another example is a student who had trouble kind of lifting their foot to put on a shoe, either sitting or standing. And, you know, a yoga practice can bring those great benefits to make that functional movement happen a lot more easily. So I'll just click through a couple of these other ones that you can read on the screen, all things that may happen for a student as they practice. And then I'll point out just another example of a story here with soothing stress. So I would say that this is another really common desired outcome for why maybe people come to yoga and want to discover yoga. And it really can happen very often for students that we might hear as teachers after a class that are that the people are less worried and less preoccupied about everything that's going on in life. The stress level just brought down a little bit. And of course, that's really valuable at any time. Um, but I think that really, especially again, this past year of the pandemic, most of us or all of us, I would say, have, have had an increased stress level of some point. Um, so that really, again, brings the value of having a practice like yoga um, into that really good focus. So let's just continue on, show a couple of the other benefits, um, wonderful things to have in your mental and physical um, promotion. Okay, so last point I'll just give an example on is the promoting sound sleep example. Um, so who doesn't love to have a great, solid, wonderful night of sleep? Uh, and there's a particular student I'm thinking of with an example of this that she does a pose called legs up the wall every night, and that is literally exactly what it sounds like. You put your legs up against the wall, um, and she's reported to me that any night she happens to skip that, she has a lot more trouble sleeping. So it's been a very beneficial part of her practice in her life. And again, I'll just kind of click through some of these other ones, wonderful both physical and mental benefits that you can get from yoga. And then I will let Tracy kind of take over to talk about this last point of um, just kind of increasing and encouraging a healthy lifestyle. Um, yeah, so I, I love this particular benefit of yoga, that yoga is holistic and it encourages a whole healthy lifestyle. Um, the practice is holistic because it influences other aspects of life and in turn life influences the practice. Uh, yoga practice highlights your strengths and weaknesses and provides lots of informative feedback and life lessons along the way um, well beyond exercise. So um, for example, I had a student who successfully quit smoking um, after practicing yoga, claiming that they would rather have their breath and that they found the breathing practices to be much more nourishing. Um, so not only does yoga help one achieve the physical health benefits, um, also known as homeostasis or bodily equilibrium, it encourages um, healthy consumption of food and of all things. Um, it encourages healthy relationships, healthy work, service, and more. It's really meant to be a lifelong personalized tool to live better. So this leads us into more of the mental benefits of yoga. So we have enhanced mood and mental outlook up there. We have equilibrium in body and mind, self-study and reflection. We have spirituality. Um, so now this is an important feature of the practice that does not necessarily mean organized religion. The spirituality that yoga provides is personal and associates more with self-study and reflection. Um, having personal spirituality is perhaps better understood more now than it was in the past. Um, it is a sense of being connected to others, perhaps other yoga practitioners, but also every other living being um, through this grand framework of nature that we have. Um, so this aspect, this uh, kind of spiritual aspect can help us feel more grounded and more meaningful in the world. Um, the, the next benefit there is um, adaptability and confidence. So these are things that um, yoga also teaches. These are huge benefits to the anxious person, <laughs> such as myself, or to everyone. 
Um, the various different yoga techniques will challenge the body, mind, and breath, encouraging positive change and adaptability. So the yoga class can be considered like a controlled stress experience that allows for self-study, self-discovery, and knowledge in a controlled environment. And then once you've developed um, that uh, self-knowledge, you can take that experience out into the real world. Um, so as the yoga student learns to overcome the challenges presented with um, humble determination and kindness towards themselves, very important, um, efficiency and confidence will develop, um, as well as clarity and a sharper sense of discernment. So decision-making will be much easier, a uh, really great practical benefit. Um, this is especially helpful when wading through the modern world, um, social media, news stories, family dramas, and crisis situations. Um, and then the last benefit um, that we have there is ability to help others. So personally, I feel that yoga has brought a sense of refinement to my own life, um, to my ideas of success, to my wants and needs, um, et cetera. It has, all, um, it has allowed unnecessary things to wane, leaving space and time and capacity to help others. So not only does this apply to yoga teachers, but also to the yoga student. Um, I do notice that yoga students tend to be a force of stability in their own families, and they are very nurturing to their communities. Just a quick thought, and I was reflecting on this when you two were both talking about just sort of the, you know, what the benefits are and why, why to think, think through things in this way is, you know, the year has been stressful and tough in a lot of ways. And do you think there's some, has there, have you seen an increase in people interested in yoga, given the current situation where they feel this extra need to connect and also come into their own, you know, well-being in a safe way where, right, an online yoga option would be a good way to do that. Um, and how do you think that will move forward as we get post-pandemic? Um, yeah, I, I can take that. I guess my, my biggest fear at the beginning of the pandemic is that um, people would forget their regular routine, their regular yoga practice, um, and not come back, and then that would be the end of my business. <laughs> but, I, I am, <laughs> but it's been the opposite. People are wanting to come back. They can't wait. I, I've, I've sent out emails asking for their input, and mm -hmm. they're very excited to come back, even after a whole year. <laughs> so I think they have realized um, how beneficial it is. And um, I mean, I guess you don't know the value of something until it's gone. Sure. <laughs> so, I mean, they're, they're very interested in, in coming back to the practice. And the participation in your virtual programming has really been a lifeline for them in a sense, or a way to keep connected or feel that connection to their routine? Yeah, definitely. Um, they've been able to stay connected to the community to see the fellow students that they would have seen, you know, every other day or so. Um, yeah, especially at the beginning um, of the pandemic when it was a little, a little bit uh, more iffy. <laughs> it, it was very nice to, to see those people, um, especially after I think it was like two weeks of downtime where before I brought the online classes um, mm -hmm. into the schedule. So it was like two weeks of no one knew what was going on. And then we were able to see each other and it was so nice. So yeah, it, it had been um, and, and is a, a nice lifeline. And Emily, are you still able to connect virtually with our students on campus then and teach in the way that you would normally do so at the Wilmore, just in a virtual manner? So I haven't been able to do virtual necessarily through the Wilmore Center, but uh, as we kind of talked a little about a little bit earlier, one decision that uh, we did make based on the pandemic was to offer the Wilmore classes outside um, over the summer and then in the early fall when students came back. So it, um, you know, one of the points on that last slide was the mental benefit being adaptability. So I think as teachers and everyone, we've certainly learned more about that adaptability. So it has been really great to still connect with students and community members and staff and faculty at the Wilmore Center um, through doing it outside and then adapting to physical distancing measures um, inside during the winter okay. months. Awesome. Thank you both. That's great clarity. 
Um, okay, so that, that leads us into this next slide, um, mindfulness, a yoga perspective. So we wanted to kind of use this webinar as an opportunity to share some of the deeper concepts about yoga. Uh, this is quite different than how we normally teach. <laughs> um, there is a lot of yoga history and philosophy out there, and I encourage you to research and read further if some of these um, concepts are of interest. But one of the single greatest lessons that I have learned through yoga is this concept of seeing behind the lens. So this is literally yoga or self-awareness or connecting to the unconditioned mind. Um, the idea here is that our mind is subject to conditioning just as a matter of human nature. Um, it, it's always going to happen. Um, conditioning comes from any sort of social institution, family, media, etc. And it creates internal narratives or lenses that shape our emotions, our desires, and our lives. So if you take a look at the little comic there, um, the telescope represents the conditioning. It's how one views the world. Um, but these internal narratives can take over our mind and our ego, leading to disappointments and suffering. So recognizing and confronting Confronting the internal narratives and tracing them back to their root can nullify their effect on the mind and the extreme emotional responses that could result from that. Um, slowing down the cyclings of the mind leads to more calmness. And that's really what we're aiming for when we're, um, tr when we're aiming for stillness, <laughs> is slowing the cyclings of the mind. Um, it can also help one navigate and negotiate life better and see the world better with more empathy and less duality. It's a really nice worldview. <laughs> so it can take a lot of practice to remove unnecessary conditioning. Uh, so this is why we do our yoga practice. Perfect. Okay, thanks for going through that perspective and sharing mental and kind of mindfulness perspectives to yoga. Um, so really in addition to sharing that, the physical and the mental, we also want to just share another part that's very important to another, another important dimension of this whole understanding of yoga, and that is yoga as a collection of practices or even a system out of one of many that there are in the world, of course, that one could choose as a way to kind of guide through life, or as we call it here on this slide, as a template for renewal. So just to give a little bit of background on this, um, the eight limbs of yoga, which is what this overall system is called, uh, comes from a historical figure called Patanjali. Patanjali was an ancient Hindu sage who has several Sanskrit works that are attributed to him that really all together kind of form the canon of the yoga tradition. So this includes a text called the Yoga Sutras, and that is a collection of teachings that really lay out the eight limbs of this path. So we'll just cover in brief again, as Tracy said, there's tons of philosophy and history to read on this. We're just going to scratch the surface of this system. So starting with the first limb, we have the Yamas. The yamas are social ethics, or another way to look at that is kind of how you interact with the world and maybe what to do, what not to do, um, and how you interact with the world outside of you. The first one, first and foremost, being ahimsa or non-harm. And that means to yourself and to others, to every, you know, every being in the world. Second, satya or truthfulness. Third is asetya or integrity also can be interpret, interpreted as kind of like non-stealing, non-greediness. And then the fourth one here, moderation or brahmacharya is the Sanskrit for that. I just wanna talk about this one a little bit further. So this moderation or non-excess really asks us to kind of accept and be aware that there is um, the divine or you know, sacred within each of us. And from that point, it asks us to not move past the point of enough into excess. And that can be in any, any regard. That could be with food, sleep, work, entertainment, material possessions. Um, and I think we can all probably relate to that in a way where maybe you've had kind of too much of a good thing and that's kind of then spoiled the whole experience for you. Um, so that could, of course, be something as you know, simple as you get a stomach ache because you're having too much birthday cake. It was so good, but you went a little bit too far. Um, or maybe you have a favorite show, but you've watched it 500 times. So now it, you know, it's not funny anymore. It doesn't have that same impact. Um, so this again, just kind of really calls us to realize when we have enough and not go into that excess. 
Aparigraha or non-attachment is the fifth one out of the yamas. And this, um, again, really kind of is non-attachment. I think if you're familiar with kind of the basic tenets, also of Buddhist philosophy, um, that thread kind of unites these two systems, that non-attachment um, of not clinging to things or people or possessions, because that can only kind of weigh us down, um, that is kind of freeing to have that perspective of non-attachment. So that sums up the first limb, the yamas. Then going into the second here with the niyamas, then it's moving inside a little bit more. These are personal practice, personal practices or personal observances to how to interact in your own self. The first one is saucha or simplicity. Second, we have santosha or contentment. And then the third I'll expand a little bit more on. It's tapas in the Sanskrit or purification. And another way it can be thought of is kind of self-discipline. So this really ties into the physical practice of the asana. And it's really a, an experience of kind of training your senses, starting to become aware and doing the practice of tapas combined with asana really can kind of heat the body, provide a sense of purification. And it kind of starts us down the path to the other limbs of yoga. Finally then, uh, for the last two, we have svadhyaya or self-study and inner exploration. We're starting then to go further inside, further into the mind and the mindfulness practice. And finally, we have Ishvara Pranidhana. So this one is devotion or surrender is another way of translating it. And it's essentially just um, a surrender or devotion to the fact of believing that the process and trusting in the process that it will work and take you farther on this path. So that's a lot to fit in a little bit. And then I'll finally just on the last part here, highlight the asana. So even though I'm just making this a small footnote, this part is the physical postures. So this is what we usually see and think of when we talk about yoga is mainly that physical part. But as you're starting to see here, it's just one small component of this whole system of practice. So the asana is the postures, um, it does also literally translate to the word seat or a seated posture. And we'll see how that ties in um, two slides from now. And just for kind of extra reference for the Sanskrit, if you ever have been in a yoga class and heard things like Tadasana, Trikanasana, Bakasana, that asana always makes up a part of the official um, Sanskrit name of the pose. So I'll pass it back over to Tracy then to go on to the rest of the limbs. Yeah, so um, continuing, we have five more limbs here. Um, pranayama is mindful breathing. There are many breathing techniques for different purposes, but at its, at its basic level, it's just being aware of your breath and protecting the integrity of the breath. Um, it's the thing that makes us alive uh, because you can never hurt the body if you are protecting the breath. And then we have pratyahara. This is withdrawing the senses and interiorization. The purpose of this is to separate the subtle from the gross, meaning the external physical world. Um, so withdrawing sensory experience allows for turning inward and turning towards the subtle and a more transcendent experience. It is um, necessary to move on to the next three limbs. So these next three limbs kind of go together, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. Dharana is one-pointed concentration um, or identifying a cycling in the mind. In Sanskrit, it's also called the samskara. Dhyana is meditating on that cycling or tracing the cycling back to its root cause. And then samadhi is when the cycling has been settled and integration has been reached, meaning the samskara no longer affects the mind or the ego. Perfect. Okay, thanks for covering the last of those, Tracy. Uh, we're coming close now to our interactive element of our presentation that we have with you today, um, where we'll put into practice some of these yoga principles and do some asana, do some uh, pranayama as well with the physical postures and some breathing. So just to really quickly recap, why do asana? Why pursue that third limb of the physical element, the physical postures of yoga? Well, certainly you can see we have another great list here of great reasons and benefits. First, gaining awareness of the body and what's actually going on inside that can directly lead into point number two of really being able to 
kind of take control, have more agency over your own health. It goes right into point three then of preventing disembodiment. If you're aware of what's going on, you're not going to kind of get that disconnection between mind and body. It might remove manifestations of trauma. And uh, as the last important point here, it's also a prep for the body for that actual meditation process. So as you kind of saw with those eight limbs, the asana is number three, and then it goes later on into those more interior processes of the last three that just that Tracy just talked about. So kind of getting the body heated and you know stretched out is another way to really just prep the body for that more um, concentration and meditation process. So with that, we're gonna um, pass it back over to Tracy to kind of intro what we will have for our interactive practice. Yeah, so on this on last slide here, um, we have a representative sample of a typical asana-based yoga class. Um, if you were to attend a yoga class, you likely wouldn't hear much at all about anything we've talked talked about so far, <laughs> there would be no lecture like that. It would be all physical based asana type and maybe some breathing exercises as well. Um, so what we have here is a, a representative sample of what might happen in a yoga class with a few different techniques and stretches to try at home or in your office. Um, so here we will take it back to video. and I will lead you through a breathing practice. So find a comfortable seat in your chair, feeling the connection between your seat in the chair, feeling the connection between your feet and the floor, feeling grounding. And then let's place our right hand on our low belly and our left hand on the low ribs. And then I'll invite you to close the eyes. And begin to turn your attention towards your breathing. Breathe through the nostrils if it's workable. Taking slow, smooth inhales, slow, smooth exhales. And the breath can either be subtle or deep. And see if you can cycle the breath between these two points, the low belly and the low ribs. a sense of groundedness and connection between the two. And then at the end of your exhale, let's gently open the eyes and then replace the hands. So let's place both hands on the low ribs, like one hand on each side of the rib cage. And then once again, you may close the eyes focus inward on the breath, breathing into the lungs and breathing into the ribs, expanding the spaces between your ribs, both front and back, sending the breath in all directions. Allowing the belly space to feel um, expansive, and finding a sense of freedom as you breathe. Where there are no restrictions. And at the end of your exhale, again, let's open the eyes and replace the hands. Let's place the right hand on the low belly. This is the last um, placement. 
And we'll place the left hand at the top of the chest, near the collarbones or the base of the throat. And then once again, we'll close the eyes. And see if you can cycle your breath between these two points. Allowing the torso to feel spacious with breath. Allowing the breath to feel nourishing and refreshing. And creating a kind of breath that has a lot of integrity, a kind of breath that you'd like to protect. Remembering that you can never hurt the body if you're protecting the breath. And then on an exhale, let's lower the hands down to the thighs with the palms facing upward, indicating an open and receptive awareness. Take a few more breaths, filling up the torso, and then also sending the breath down the arms and the legs innervating your fingers and toes. Preparing for movement. At the end of your exhale, gently open the eyes to a soft and panoramic gaze. And then here, I will turn the instruction over to Emily. I will reset. Thank you, Tracy. Okay, now that we're stuck out of our breath and we established that connection to the integrity of the breath, we'll bring in a little bit of movement with it. So, from where you are, I'm assuming most are seated. If you aren't, if you could find your way to a chair. And as you can see with Tracy, kind of sitting forward to the front side of the chair. And make sure you just have a little bit of space open in front of you so that you don't have a desk just right in front of you. We're gonna take some movement with the breath. So usually coordinating one breath, one movement is something called a vinyasa. And that's a very common feature of a yoga class. So sitting tall, lifting up through the heart, lifting up through the spine, starting with hands on the thighs. With a big inhale, lift the arms up overhead, reaching up through the fingertips. Exhale, we'll fold down to a forward fold over the legs, letting your head and torso drape down over the legs. Inhale, lift the heart up halfway. Exhale, drape back down, resting over the legs. With an inhale, sweep all the way up overhead, reaching your arms high. Exhale, let the hands gently fall to the sides. We'll take this movement one more time. We'll inhale, energetically move up with the breath. Exhale, drape down, following, folding all the way over the legs. Inhale, lift the heart up halfway. Exhale, fold back down. Next inhale, reach high all the way up, reaching up through the fingertips and exhale, we'll take the hands down. Now I will ask you to stand up if you're able in your space. Um, we'll come up to a, a common standing pose sequence, one that might look very familiar to you if you've seen yoga or practiced yoga. We'll come into warrior two. So with this from a standing position, you can step the right foot back, lay the heel flat as you can see Tracy demonstrating. So that back foot is flat, there's a bend to the right knee, and then you're reaching out wide through both arms and bending over the right hand. Really try to focus in on your breath pattern. Let the shoulders relax away from the ears and just feel that expansiveness across the collarbones and out to the fingertips. Moving into another pose here, let's drop the back hand down onto the legs. You're bringing 
that hand down to the matching thigh and then tilting back as you reach up high through the left arm, reaching up into this reverse warrior, the front knee still stays bent. And again, you're staying grounded in your breath, smooth in, smooth out. With an inhale, let's return to warrior two, arms out wide. And exhale, gently let the arms fall and then switch the arrangement of the feet so that you're stepping your back foot forward, the other foot goes back and the back foot is flat. And then again, bending in that front knee, reaching out wide and just settling down into your center of gravity as you stay steady in the breath. Coming into reverse warrior, the back arm drops down along the leg as you tilt back reaching up high through the top arm. You can either gaze up for that hand if it feels okay, or maybe more grounded, you could gaze down toward the back thigh as another option. So find what works for you, paying attention to what's going on in the body and just listening to that and respecting it. With an inhale, let's pull back up to warrior two and exhale, the hands can drop. All right, so stepping back just to a neutral position with both feet planted about hip width distance apart, we call this equal standing um, or Thomas BT. We're going to come into figure four, a standing balance pose. So let's start out standing on the right leg, bring the left ankle over to the base of the thigh. And from here, hands come together along the midline, and then you're gonna imagine that you're sitting down in a chair. So sending the hips down, bending at the knee, coming into kind of a squat position. And again, you can refer to Tracy to see it in profile, full body. So we're making that figure four in the legs, lifting the heart and breathing strong and steady to support your balance. It might be helpful in a standing balance pose to find a fixed spot on the ground and just softly, kind of with an unfocused gaze, keep your concentration there. It's okay to have wiggles and movement, just keep the breath flowing. With an inhale, let's stand tall, uncross the leg, and then take it to the second side. So planting the left leg down, taking the right ankle over to that figure four position. And with an exhale, bend the knee, lower the hips, imagining almost that you're sitting in a chair as you just softly gaze ahead over the fingertips, keeping the focus on the flow of the breath. With an inhale, stand tall, uncross. Everything can come back up just to your standing neutral position. And we have just a little bit of time for the last part, our constructive rest. So if you're able in your space, um, we, I invite you to actually lay down on the floor. There's nothing special we have to do. So if you can't see your computer, you can just listen to my voice. So you can be laying down. You could also take legs up which is exactly what it sounds like. You just bring both legs vertically up toward the ceiling. This can be done here or up against the wall as a good restful position. So whether you just wanna stay reclining in Shavasana or legs up, I invite you to close the eyes, allow the body to rest easy and the breath to come naturally. Let me just take a few moments of stillness and rest at the end of each yoga practice let everything integrate and the mind to be still. I know we're coming to the end of our scheduled time. So I invite you, we just had a mini brief preview of Shavasana. Normally we'd take it for a couple minutes. 
Um, but I invite you to maybe roll over to one side for a moment, gently reawaken the body to come back to awareness. And then eventually come back upright to a seated position, whether that's on the ground or if you want to come back to your chair. And we will end um, the formal part of our presentation here with how we normally end a yoga practice in class, bringing the hands together along the midline in front of the heart. We usually just exchange uh, the word namaste as a mark of respect um, and recognition for one another. So namaste. Namaste. That does again really kind of conclude the formal practice that we have um, for everyone today. So happy to take a couple minutes of questions, but thanks so much for being here and listening into our presentation. What a wonderful time spent today together. Thank you, Emily and Tracy. I, I was just laying on the floor of my office. So luckily no one can see what I'm doing in here, but what a, it, I just feel awesome. It's great. It's so wonderful. And Roberta chimed in that she does a weekly chair yoga class on Zoom as well and really enjoys those balance exercises and, and things as well. So I'm feeling great. This is exciting. Um, thank you so much for sharing. I think the thing I really think about is, you know, all the things that have happened over the last year and there's so much we've cut back on, right? You have just less things you can do and ways you can interact, but this is something that I feel like builds you up in a different way um, and gives people a different perspective on how they might like to or um, spend their time in a really um, different maybe place than they were pre-pandemic, which I, I really love that sort of experience. Um, and it, I had asked this question of our panelists last time, but I was thinking, you know, is there something obviously that's, you know, something that changed in the way that, you know, your yoga practice is, in, is done or, you know, something you've seen during the pandemic that you feel like will never go back to the way that it used to be? Mm. <laughs> uh, something that, do you mean in teach, teaching wise or what? Anything, okay. just a, reflect, a reflective, reflection point of, you know, this has changed in the way that we do things and I don't think it'll ever be different. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, yeah, I guess, um, yeah, I guess at the beginning of the pandemic, um, the, the mask wearing, um, I think people are meditating more now than they were pre-pandemic. Um, because of the situation that we have all been in for the last year, and the mask especially is like a, is like a tool that's on their face and makes them think and meditate about the situation. <laughs> They, had, they never had a meditation tool like that before. Um, so the thing that I think is different is people are a little bit more introspective now um, yeah. about many things, not just the mask, lots of right. things in general. Yeah. And that, to you, that's something that's gonna, make, gonna stay longer term than the pandemic. Yeah. yeah. Emily, anything come to mind for you of just how the year has been and what may not go back to the old way? Yeah, absolutely. And something um, that comes to mind on that is also just like what we just did here of being this, that yoga can be for everyone. It can be everywhere that you don't need any specialized equipment. It's just you and some space is all that you need. Um, to do, you know, the, the yoga, the asana practice, of course, right. the meditative aspects that can be done, you know, in here all day long. So I think that especially as, as we continue through this, um, that just recognizing that yoga can be anywhere at all and at any time is there for, it's there for you. Um, right. So it is a practice that's very like portable and applicable. And I think students have gotten more comfortable with that of now they're not only coming into the studio, they're doing it you know, from their kitchen, from their home. So I think people are really realizing like how many places this can go and that it doesn't have to only be reserved for the studio. I think the studio has a very important place because you get the community and the connection and the direct experience with the teachers um, and the community, but it can be much more portable. And I think people have realized that and will take that forward. Right, it can be for anyone in any place 
and you don't have to have a physical studio to go to. You can participate virtually and probably connect in different ways, um, which is really, I think, something a lot of people may be lacking or feel, mm -hmm. right? They're only with their family unit or their home you know, household. This is a way they can still connect and interact as long as we need to. And then moving forward, they can come back to the community in the studio. Well, I appreciate it so much and I'm looking forward to um, doing some yoga at alumni weekend and continue to think about how we can share things, especially virtually with alumni at large. Cause I think, right, being in an office environment all day, it's a nice little pick me up and a change of pace and how, you know, there's some great pointers and what you can do just even for a few minutes to help kind of ground yourself and, and relax and uh, move on to the next thing, especially if you're having kind of a stressful day for sure. So I appreciate it so much. And again, look forward to kind of continuing to work together with you, Emily, and you, Tracy, here in Ripon to, to figure out how we can support each other and move forward and continue to keep that mindfulness and that physical practice of yoga. Um, I will remind everyone that we have our next, um, our Connections uh, mental wellness discussion on mental health and mindfulness. So nice tie into what we've learned about today. Um, that'll be in two weeks on April 23rd. So I'm looking forward to that discussion. And again, be able to relate it back to our yoga practice today. Thank you so much. Thank you. So everyone. Much, Thank you. Appreciate it.